the church in America is going to suffer so terribly. And we laugh now, but they will come after us. And they will come after our children. They will close the net around us while we are playing soccer mom and soccer dad, while we are arguing over so many little things and mesmerized by so many trinkets. The net even now is closing around you and your children and your grandchildren, and it does not cause you to fear. You will be isolated from society, as has already happened. Anyone who tries to run for office who actually believes the Bible will be considered a lunatic until finally we are silenced. We will be called things that we're not and persecuted not for being followers of Christ, but for being radical fundamentalists who do not know the true way of Christ, which of course is love and tolerance. You'll go down as the greatest bigots and haters of mankind in history. They've already come after your children. And for most of you, they got them. They got them through the public schools and indoctrination and the university and indoctrination. And then you wonder why your children come out not serving the Lord. It's because you fed them right into the devil's mouth. So little by little, the net is closing around. And then it's not little by little. Look how fast things are going downhill just in a matter of weeks. Matter of weeks. But at the same time, know this. Persecution is always meant for evil, but God always means it for good. And is it not better to suffer in this life to have an extra weight of glory in heaven? You must settle this in your mind. This is the one thing I want to say over and over. Do not believe. Down through history, you have a wrong idea of martyrdom and persecution. You think that these men were persecuted and martyred for their sincere faith in Jesus Christ. That was the real reason, but no one heard that publicly. They were martyred and they were persecuted as enemies of the state, as child molesters, as bigots, as narrow-minded, stupid people who had fallen for a ruse and can contribute nothing to society. Your suffering will not be noble. So your mind must be filled with the Word of God when all people persecute you and turn on you. And if the Spirit of God in common grace pulls back and you see even your children and your grandchildren tossing in the lot that you should die. This is no game. You want revival and awakening, but know this. For the most part, great awakenings have come only preceding great national catastrophes or the persecution of the church. I believe God is bringing a great awakening, but I believe that He is raising up young men who are strong in trust in the providence of God to be able to wade through the hell that's going to break loose on us. And it will be on us before we even recognize it. Unless, unless in God's providence, he is not done. He is not done. And note, this is, this is not silly talk. Apart from a great awakening, these things are going to come upon you. Be ready to lose your homes, your cars, and everything. Where do you see the church with its relationship to the government in five years regarding the issue of homosexuality? If things keep going the way they're going and there is no uh, blessing from God in the sense of widespread repentance, uh, it's all-out warfare and eventually a complete loss of all the protections that we've had in regards to taxation. Um, I believe... 501c3 gone. Yeah, I believe that uh, that'll be considered discrimination. It'll be under uh, hate crimes laws. And um, as a result, I think there is going to be a fundamental... Uh, reorganization of Christian education. It's either going to have to abandon any type of specific uh, Christian label, uh, or it's going to have to exist without Pell Grants, uh, student loans, any of those kinds of things. It's going to have to be completely done separately from and fully taxed, and uh, maybe even at a higher rate than, uh, than the government. And I think that's eventually going to re do what may be a good thing, because I don't know about you, when someone asks me, where does the New Testament teach about Christian education? I can only think of one text, and that's where Paul says to Timothy, pass on the things you've heard from me to trustworthy men. 
Well, the only way I can know if someone's trustworthy is if I live with them. In other words, that education is taking place within the context of the local church. And I think there's going to be a whole lot more of that in the future, absolutely of necessity. Because unless God grants some type of reprieve, some type of restraint of this out-of-control train, it seems to me that what is becoming the prevalent note in the society is that what you do, Todd Friel, and what I do in expressing our Christian faith is going to be classified as hate and bigotry and is going to be against the law of the land. What you just saw now was two uh, videos from men that I hold in high esteem. The first one was from Paul Washer. The second one was from Dr. James White. And both of them are kind of saying the same things. Um, they're saying that persecution will come to the American church. Uh, persecution will look uh, exactly what it's looking like today in our time, especially in the state that I am in, which is California. I know that it's just as bad in other liberal states like New York. Um, but we're seeing it. We're seeing it happen right before our eyes. And we're seeing it increase on a daily basis, from day to day, um, the agenda of the government and of the liberal left, it's increasing and it's moving at a pace that is uh, just incredibly fast. It's just moving so fast that the church doesn't even know what to do or what to say about it. And part of the issue here is that the church has been in this state of uh, perpetual security um, where it has found itself comfortable being part of the system. And what I mean by this is that the church does not see itself as a separate entity, as a separate system from our own government. It actually relies on the government for its own uh, thriving for its own uh, living. And this is going to be a problem, especially when the persecution starts to come, because the government is going to start to uh, expect things from the church, expect tolerance, ex at, uh, it's going to expect plurality, it's going to ex expect acceptance of sinful things. And already we can see the church buckling under the pressure and the weight of the masses and of the government. We see it in the, uh, the different denominations, the Presbyterian, the Episcopalian. Uh, we see it in the Methodist. We see it in all different types of, of denominations. We see it happening in the church. And it's sad. It's sad because we have men like these Paul Washer and Dr. James White, who have been warning us that this has been coming. They have been prophesying to us, whether they knew they were prophesying, but maybe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have spoken a word to us. And the scripture is constantly telling us to be sober, to be vigilant of the times. And regardless of, of your eschatology, whatever you believe as the end times, just pause for a minute and take notice of what's happening here. Here in America, we are being pushed outside of the, the social systems. We are being pushed aside as, as tyrants, as bigots, as, um, as enemies of the people, as enemies of the state. And the more laws that they pass, restricting us from being able to express our beliefs and our faith in God and in Christ and in Scripture, the more they restrict us from being able to do that, the more we're going to become enemies of the state. Now, I am an ex-army sergeant, medical sergeant. I was stationed out in Fort Bragg for five years. I did my time in service in the Army. I'm a United States citizen. I was born here in California. Um, I am a legal citizen. But that is all going to go out the window. My time in service in the army, my citizenship, my rights, that is all going to go out the window because I am a citizen of heaven first. And as a citizen of heaven, I'm an alien to this world. And as an alien to this world, I have no rights in this world. 
I don't know why Christians think that they have rights in this world. We have been privileged and we have been very fortunate and very blessed to have these rights here in America. But we do not um, own these rights. If God is bringing judgment, which I believe He is, and I know for a fact that Dr. James White also sees uh, where the, the United States is headed, he sees this as the judgment of God, as God releasing the nations to, to its own depravity. And I am agreeing with him 100%. I know Dr. Uh, John Piper has also mentioned this before, and he has um, also seen this happening way before um, this massive move has has started just a couple of years ago, and it's increasing more and more every day. And I, I know Paul Washer has also prophesied, and other men of the Reformed faith, and other men from other types of faith as well, the non-Reformed faiths, I know that they have also seen this and have, and have said words uh, in discerning the times. But to think that because you were born in the United States and because you're an American citizen, that somehow you deserve these rights. But if you're a citizen of heaven first, if you're a citizen of the kingdom of God first, your citizenship with God in heaven is going to be at odds. It's going to clash with your citizenship with the government here. And so to assume that just because you're an American citizen that you have rights as a Christian, it, that's all going to go out the window. There's going to be tons and tons of people. There's going to be thousands and thousands of Christians who are going to lose their liberties, who are going to lose um, their uh, freedoms because they're going to be labeled enemies of the Constitution. They're going to be labeled enemies of the state. If you're spreading hate crimes and if you're viewed as a social terrorist and if you're viewed as somebody who is constantly uh, causing up riots and you're going to be labeled as an enemy of the people. And as soon as you're labeled that, you lose your rights. You lose it. You don't get to keep those rights. And so, I don't know why we think here in America that we're somehow special uh, because we have freedoms when we are citizens of heaven. And as citizens of heaven, we are, al we are aliens, we're sojourners, we're foreigners in this world. And if the world begins to hate us and label us as enemies, and if God so chooses in His divine sovereignty to allow persecution and suffering to happen to the American church, then be ready. Get ready because it's coming like a freight train. It's coming so fast and it's coming so violently that we don't even know what to do in response to this. It is now the norm to label a Christian equal with that of an Islamic extremist and as, as an as Islamic terrorist. It, they make it as equals, as if we are part of the same problems. When our very scriptures teach us to bless those who persecute us, to pray for those, and to uh, love those who don't love us, that is the nature of the Christian message, and yet they are putting us in the same category as Islamic terrorists. Why? Because the world hates us. Because we spread the, the, the good news of Jesus Christ and we reveal the darkness of the world by shining the light of Christ. So, to, please, please listen to me, brothers and sisters. Look at what's happening in America today. Look at what is taking place in our government. Look at what's taking place in our social and justice systems, they are all depraved. They are all fallen. Nothing in this world is ever going to uh, become better for the Christian man or woman. It's going to intensify in persecution. It's going to intensify 
in hatred towards us, and it's only going to get worse. We're going to enter into a time of huge persecution. I'm only 27 years old. I got saved about four years ago. I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor. And I only got saved about four years ago. And ever since I got saved, I can see from the moment I got saved, the massive changes in government and in, uh, in our systems to labeling us as haters and enemies of the state, just like Paul Washer has, has said, just like Dr. James White has said, just as John Piper has said before, these things are coming. The love of many are growing colder and colder by the day. Good things are being called evil and evil things are being called good more and more each and every day. They're passing laws labeling evil things as good things. That somehow these laws are the final authority to morality and to godly virtue. But we know that as Christians, we follow what Scripture says about morality because we have an objective standard, and that is the ultimate standard of truth, of morality, and of virtue, the Word of God. And because we stand by the Word of God as citizens of heaven, and we reject anything that goes contrary to that, and if the state is labeling laws that are saying that the things that are mentioned in our authority are evil, then we must finally say, is it better to listen to God or to man? And when we start to ask the question ourselves, is it better to listen to God or to man? And we begin to go against the laws because we need to listen to God first. Then the laws will label us as enemies and as lawbreakers. They will view us as threats. And as Paul Washer said, they will take away our homes they will strip us away from our families and they will take away our freedoms and they will do horrible things to us. This is nothing new. This is nothing new for the church. What has been new is this couple hundred of years of, of freedom, of non-persecution here in America. That is new but it's not new for the church to undergo persecution even peter said that we were going to go through persecution and that when it finally comes upon us that we were not supposed to be surprised by it in first peter chapter 4 verse 12 it says beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Persecution has been promised to us. Jesus said that we were going to face persecutions. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus told us, He says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We have been very fortunate. We have been extremely fortunate to not have uh, been going through persecution for such a long time. But I believe wholeheartedly that my generation, that is my age group, um, the ones, the millennials, as soon as we start taking the positions of pastors and of elders in the church, and as we start to take senior positions, I believe that we will be the first in leadership positions to begin to experience the first massive wave of persecution, of pain, of suffering, of loss, and of death even. I think it will come upon us first. So brothers and sisters, especially men and women my age, listen to me. We must prepare ourselves we must be in steadfastness in accordance to the Word of God. We must rely wholeheartedly on the Spirit of God. We must learn to crucify the flesh. We must learn 
to die to ourselves in order that the Spirit might empower us to live for Him, to persevere, to live for truth, to stand for what is right, to stand for what is good, even if that means that we are taken away from our families, even if that means our liberties are stripped from us, even if that means we are stoned to death. Because the reality of it is is that it might happen. I think it will start to happen soon. Christians will go out. We will proclaim the good news. And guess what? The masses will begin to trample us underfoot. And we, we, we will begin to suffer for the sake of the gospel. I can see it happening already. I can see it intensifying. I can see it going to uh, an extreme place of tyranny. We will be terrorized by our society. The church has always flourished from the death and the blood of the martyrs. And I have been hearing over and over again about revival happening, revival happening, revival coming. But let me urge you, brothers and sisters, to not think that it is coming simply for the sake of coming. But I think it will come in the most intense and powerful persecution that we have ever experienced in America before. I pray and I, and I hope that you would uh, listen to godly older men, older men who have gone through certain experiences of persecution, who have, um, have been steadfast in their faith, who have uh, persevered in their faith. I urge you to go to these men, to listen to the counsel, to listen to the wisdom, especially us millennial, millennials. We got to listen to our elders. We got to listen to our pastors. We need to learn to submit to them. We need to learn to heed their words. They have wisdom and they have knowledge beyond us. And we need to be able to learn from them. We do not know anything yet. We need to start conforming to the image of Christ. And we, learn, we need to learn uh, to, to just surrender all to Jesus and to the power of the Spirit. We need to learn to give everything to the Father. And if the Father gives us the gift of martyrdom, we need to learn to embrace it wholeheartedly. Please, please, please listen to these men. Listen to Dr. John Piper, to Dr. James White. Listen to Paul Washer, these men of the Reformed faith. Listen to Jeff Durbin. Listen to John MacArthur. These men who have studied the scriptures, these men who are reformed, these men who love the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, who have fought the good fight, who are still running the race. Listen to these men. They have wisdom that we need to hold on to. And I pray that we would be able to enter into battle together in the coming years. I know that times will be difficult. I know that times will be tough. But if we learn to be one in mind and one in the Spirit of God, and if we learn to unite as a church, then we can persevere through this coming persecution. I pray that you are blessed. Please stay in prayer, stay in the Word, stay in fasting Encourage one another. Motivate one another. Go work for the kingdom of God. Go get plugged into a church. Go get plugged in with a community of believers. Work together. Fast together. Pray together. Love each other. Hold on to one another because the time will come when they will begin to rip us away from each other. I love you very much. Every single one of my brothers and sisters. Whether we agree on our theology or not, it does not matter. I love you, and I hope and I pray that you would enter into this battle with me. Please share this video. Share your thoughts. Share your ideas. Share your comments. Let us build one another up so that we can hold fast to one another, to the love of Christ, to the power of the Spirit, and to the perseverance that only the Father can grant to us. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you always. 
In Jesus' name, amen.